Okay, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, SAO colloquium session. And today we have Professor Menowan Zanin from uh, Northwest University Purchase Room. He is a professor in digital humanities. And uh, Professor completed his PhD from University of Leeds in 2002. And, and uh, after that, he joined uh, as an assistant professor in Tilburg University, and now currently working as a full professor at Northwest University in Pochestro. His work is uh, his work is mainly related to digital humanities, but he has a lot of uh, experience of finding patterns and uh, in 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 uh, linguistic sentences. So his work is mainly related to computer science, which can, which may be interesting for many of us working in uh, working for software development or working for uh, astronomy uh, in radio or optical. So not wasting much of your time in in this, let us welcome Professor for his uh, uh, today's colloquium. Thanks a lot, Professor, for uh, accepting our invitation. Now thank you. it's your thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you very much for the uh, for the invitation. I very much uh, appreciate it. Uh, I have to say, um, I have to give a, a bit of a warning. I really don't know much about uh, astronomy. Actually, I don't know anything about astronomy. Um, but I still think this this talk can be interesting. At least I hope it will be interesting. Um, so let me quickly uh, uh, say a little bit about the, um, the, the the background where this came from. Um, I was introduced to Vanessa McBride, who uh, actually gave a presentation at a digital humanities colloquium a few weeks uh, a few weeks ago um, and at first I also so she talked about the, the uh, kind of potential overlap between uh, what's being done at astronomy and, and and potential relationships with humanities or digital humanities and at first I thought you know, there's I don't think there's anything there I'm, I don't know what I can expect and I very much appreciated that presentation. I think there is um, a, a large potential for for overlap between work that, that, that you're doing in the broad sense and what digital humanities um, of research can do in the broad sense. Um, so what I'd, what I'd like to do today, I'd like to first um, uh, introduce a little bit on, uh, take a little bit of time to introduce what digital humanities is. Um, and I'll give a very short history of what digital humanities uh, what the field of digital humanities has done in South Africa. So this is more kind of a short historical overview. Uh, and that then introduces the South African Center for Digital Language Resources, SADILAR. That's currently where I work. So we're hosted at the uh, Northwest University, but I, I really work for SADILAR. So that should give a bit of a background on digital humanities and uh, the, the current situation. And then at the end, I would like to show a few of the, the kind of techniques that are being used in digital humanities. And, and there, I hope so. This is where I feel I'm, I, no, I don't feel uncomfortable describing the techniques, but um, I, I hope that I've, uh, that I'll, I'll illustrate a few techniques that might be relevant for you as well, or at least that you can see, you know, this could be something in this direction. I could, you know, reuse these techniques or they're kind of general techniques. Perhaps you're already using these techniques. And wait a minute, perhaps I can also apply them to humanities um, data. And I think that's where the, the kind of interesting potential collaborations lie. But yeah, without knowing exactly what your problems are, what kind of techniques you're using, this I think is the, 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 the interesting area that we perhaps should um, look at later as well. Okay, so first of all, what is digital humanities? Um, now, this, it's actually interesting. So I'm a professor in digital humanities. Um, so you, yeah, you'd think that, that I would know what this is. Um, but some time ago, I was actually preparing a presentation uh, on the history of humanities. Uh, and there, uh, an, an, an overview of the history of digital humanities. And I realized, no, I actually don't really know what digital humanities is. And to make matters worse, then I thought, you know, at least I can look up what humanities is, but I don't know exactly what the field of humanities is either. So there's no clear boundary there describing or this falls within humanities or this falls within digital humanities and this doesn't. 
but fortunately, there's this nice website uh, called whatisdigitalhumanities.com. And there is a collection of quotes from uh, participants of the day, of, uh, the day of Digital Humanities. And so they all define what they think is digital humanities. And there are quite a few interesting uh, definitions there. I'll, I'll give you a few just to give a bit of an idea. Um, so digital humanities can be what sits at the intersection of computational method and the, the traditional pursuits of the humanities. Okay, so that already gives a bit of an idea of what, what digital humanities is. Um, another one, digital humanities, is the use of digital technologies to generate and answer new questions relevant to humanities scholar and to share and transform scholarship and its modes of creation and dis dissemination. So here you see there's a, a slightly different focus, but it's not a completely different definition. Let's take another uh, look at another one. Uh, digital humanities is an academic and social engagement with electronic, fo electronic formats of human cultural processes and forms such as literature, art, history, and music. So you see, again, this is a slightly different definition. Um, so I looked at, at several of these and I found that there are uh, there, there is some overlap. So it's not that we really have no clue what digital humanities is. So one of the things is that it tries to kind of generate and answer new questions, right? So questions relevant to the humanities that people perhaps in the past uh, well, they might have asked themselves this, but they couldn't answer this because it requires computational techniques. So we're thinking of anal uh, analyzing large amounts of data, for example, which, you know, it, it can perhaps be done without a computer, but really uh, computers come to help much there. So adding the digital will help um, kind of answer these new questions. Um, so as you saw in, in the definition we, did, we just looked at, it kind of blends these humanities and digital techniques. So there, there's a very much humanities uh, research side to it with questions, context, and theories coming from the humanities. But it also requires the knowledge of you know, digital technique, computer science, to be able to actually um, handle the data, for example. And the, the idea is that the results is more than the ingredients. So we have this kind of nice blender there. You know, you throw in digital techniques, you throw in humanities, and you and you get this, this new thing. Um, now, what I notice if I look at the research being done in the field of digital humanities, you see that it's often crossing boundaries. Um, so you have people with a strong computational background, and they might collaborate with people from uh, from linguistics or from musicology or from history or from you know visual arts or or something like that and both groups or both researchers actually bring something to the to the discussion so if you're a computer scientist you might simply not know about all the theories coming from the humanities but clearly if you're kind of a traditional humanities researcher you might not have a lot of experience with computational uh, techniques so it's also trying to find the the, the common terminology um, but if you can get that working then you can actually answer these new questions because you can do new things um, okay so what you often see is that there, there are two researchers two, or two research groups working together because you need to have the knowledge from both fields um, okay, now there are some kind of intermediate groups that already cross boundaries so there's something called computational linguistics we have people with a knowledge from linguistics and computational skills or computational musicology. So it's not always two groups, but I think you get the idea. So this really requires skills from both fields to be able to do this. Okay, so now let's take, take a quick look at what, what, what's going on in South Africa. Uh, so we have a bit of a context of, of what's happening here. Um, so South Africa is, is relatively late to the, um, to the field of digital humanities, uh, but, but there's still hope. Um, so what I could find is that essentially around the year 2000, um, some uh, initiative started the South African History Online a website, for example, in 2000, uh, Digital Innovation in South Africa, International Library of African Music. So this is around the year 2000. The focus was very much on digitization and, and archiving. So there's not a lot of research questions and computational techniques to apply to the data, but more, you know, how do we make this data available. Then a few years later, so 2004, for example, the, uh, the Center for Text Technology uh, was founded. Um, and 
so just after 2000, there was a kind of an emerging field um, of computational linguistics. Um, so you see there are several universities working on that sort of focus kind of shifted a little bit, not saying that archiving went away, but this is more, you know, applying computational techniques to humanities data. Um, so there are several organizations who worked on this. Uh, in 2012, the Resource Management Agency um, was founded with the idea of storing um, computational linguistic resources, so corpora, text collections, speech collections, um, and computational linguistic tools. Okay, then uh, around say 2014, uh, we see some um, digital humanities activities, but this is not structured at all. This is really you know, popping up at different places in the country. A University of Pretoria organized a symposium, uh, digital humanities and represent representations of self. At Durban University and Northwest University, different uh, symposia, different um, uh, events were, were started. There's a little bit more there. Um, but these are all kind of individual you know, groups or in people kind of organizing these. There are no structured um, approach. Now in 2016, the Digital Humanities Association of Southern Africa was founded. Uh, and this organization still exists. Um, it joined the ADO, that's the, um, the, the worldwide kind of organization of digital humanities organizations. Um, so DASA joined uh, ADO in 2018. So they're really part of this worldwide um, community. So if you want to know more about DASA, there's a link uh, for you to check out. Okay, but then, um, so, so I was talking quickly, going back to the previous slide, I was talking to the, about this resource management agency. Um, government realized, you know, that that uh, agency is there, but there's no continuous funding. So what they did is they, um, they, they founded the South African Center for Digital Language Resources. That's where I work. So this is a research infrastructure um, funded by the, uh, the Department of Science and Innovation uh, within the SARIR framework, the South African um, Research Infrastructure uh, Roadmap uh, Framework. And this is a, a, a quite large uh, organization. We have several nodes. Uh, so CTEX, I mentioned CTEX earlier, this computational linguistics uh, group uh, at Northwest University is part as a node. ISELDA is an organization that deals mostly with language testing, language learning, language testing. And that by itself is a, is a combination of different uh, institutes working on that area. University of Pretoria is our digitization node. Uh, University of South Africa, uh, South Africa is the terminology um, and node. Uh, CSIR is involved as well. Uh, they they mostly work on speech, and Stellenbosch University focuses on child language and child language learning. Uh, so I I work at the hub, which is um, hosted at the uh, Northwest University. Like I said, I mentioned this this RMA, the Research Management Agency. All the data that was collected there is now incorporated. Uh, within Sadler, so that's still available uh, on our website. Okay, so a little bit more about Sadler. So we run two programs. We have a digitization program. Um, so University of Pretoria is mostly involved there, but also uh, CTEX, the computational linguistics um, node. The idea there is to create um, and collect a digitize um, text, speech, uh, and also multimodal resources. But we also provide tools uh, computational tools um, there, so you can analyze text for example um, and some of these tools are also made available online so you can essentially upload a piece of text and get the analysis back from the website so that's the digitization program we also have a digital humanities program that i'm responsible for and the idea there is that we try to build a digital humanities um, research capacity okay so a little bit more about this digitization program um, I, I already mentioned this, so it collects and creates um, linguistic data collections. Um, so they, they really give examples how, of how people use language. It can be um, news articles, it can be um, you know, recordings of people speaking, etc. And what's interesting, at, at least from, a, from my perspective, I originally come from Europe, um, South Africa has 11 official languages and the distribution of the availability of data for these languages is really skewed. So for English, there is 
uh, quite a lot of data available. But then again, a bit because it's not only spoken in South Africa, of course. Um, but then again, if you look at the specific South African English variety, so speech, for example, there's actually not that much available. So it's it's quite limited. For Afrikaans, there, there are kind of decent amounts available. It's not much, but there is something. But for the other nine official languages, there is really a very, very limited amount of data uh, and tools available. So this is a, a big challenge. So the idea about this digitization program is to see if we can collect more of this data, uh, so digitize existing analog data, so text scanning, uh, you know, text on paper and then OCRing, for example, but also make the collections available and also make the linguistic tools available so you can actually analyze these, um, these texts in this speech. And a lot of these tools are specific for, um, for a particular language. So you need a specific tool to analyze English and another tool to analyze Afrikaans, another tool to analyze uh, Xitsonga, etc. So that's the digitization program. Now on the digital humanities program, um, the focus is a little bit different. What we try to do there is we try to um, show people, um, especially researchers in humanities and social sciences, that something like digital humanities exists. Um, so we try to show them the resources that we have, we try to show them the, the, the tools that they can use. Um, but for a lot of these researchers, these tools and the resources are, you know, are completely new to them. They have no clue, okay, perhaps I'm exaggerating a little bit, but they essentially have no clue on how to work with larger amounts of text or larger amounts of speech, uh, how to analyze that. How do, you, how do you work with the results of this analysis? How do you find patterns in these? How do you really answer these research questions when you have to use or when you're using these computational uh, approaches. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the researchers within the fields of humanities and social sciences um, that are interested in doing digital humanities. And then we try to train them on using the particular tools that we, uh, that, that we have. So we have training activities. And Recently, we I actually reassumed the focus so far has been mostly on humanities and social sciences researchers, but I actually realized, you know, what we miss, what most of our these researchers miss is the computational skills. Um, so recently, I also really started looking at, you know, where can we find people with computational skills and what do they need to be able to work on the questions and the data that come from the field of humanities and social sciences. So that's really the other side um, of the, 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 these two groups that, that we're trying to get to work together. Now, for a lot of the researchers in the field of humanities and social sciences, it's kind of unclear, you know, what, what is there and how do I use this? Um, what kind of research methodologies are there um, and where, where, where can I find all of this? You know, where do I start? I talked to a lot of these people and they, you know, they had questions like, okay, I, I've heard about programming, but, but where do I, you know, how do I start programming? And you know, what language should I choose? And okay, if I've picked a language, where, where do I then start? You know, how, how do I do this? So initially we had a lot of training uh, activities. We actually had events, so this was before the lockdown, where we got people together, sit behind a computer and just work on, on something together, uh, which I really liked because these people, you know, you could see them, they could, they could actually do something relatively quickly. It was really cool. But the uh, problem was um, that it was very ad hoc. So there was no follow up, for example. Um, so during the lockdown, we actually sat down and thought, okay, we can't do in-person events anymore. Can we come up with better ideas of getting people together to work together on these things so we can share the information, the, the skills that we have so they can actually start working in this field of digital humanities. Um, so one of the things, so, and then we started the Escalator project. So this is a project kind of developed by, by Sadler where we really try to get together humanities and computational people where we try to show them research that can be done, possibilities for conferences, um, some training events, um, et cetera. So we want this to be a community of practice where people can share their skills, their questions, et cetera. So we're currently setting this up. Uh, the URL is there if you want to uh, find more information. And uh, really the idea was to, to make this a more structured uh, approach. 
Okay, so we have a whole range of activities within the escalator project. I'm not really going to talk about uh, all of these. I'm just going to highlight a few. Um, so we were developing a regional stakeholder map. So we have an overview of who's involved in different projects, or who's interested in, um, in working in the field of digital humanities. This will be um, launched in uh, just over a week. <clears throat> Um, we also have the Digital Humanities Initiative. I'll say just a little bit more uh, about that, but we also have other things where we're trying to write scholarly articles, um, just uh, supporting research projects, etc. <clears throat> okay, so this Digital Championships, uh, uh, Champions Initiative is, uh, is really a mentorship program. So we have a whole range of uh, tracks for different people. Uh, people who really have no clue what Digital Humanities is, we can provide some information. People who already know what digital humanities is <clears throat> and they want to start working on this, um, what do they need to do? Where can they get information? There's uh, a track for uh, people who work in the field of education. How do I incorporate digital humanities techniques in my curriculum, for example? And we, uh, we actually have a track where they develop open education resources so we can share this as well with others. Um, so there, there's a whole range of tracks uh, within this. The, the main aim for this is for people who participate to grow the network, to become part of this community, right? to learn the skills, to share the skills, um, to really get interaction going. Okay, so to get the interaction going, we also opened a, a Slack. Um, so the Slack is still growing. We see people come in uh, on, a, on a regular basis. So what we do there now is share information on conferences, etc. Uh, but you also see more and more that people are asking and answering questions. And that's really what I would like to do. Um, so the idea is you're welcome to join. I, I mean, I'd, I'd love it if you if you join. The, the link is there. Um, what is currently still missing is people from the computational, um, with a computational background. So I answer a lot of computational questions there. <clears throat> But for now, we have mostly people from humanities and social sciences. So if you want to join, you're, you're definitely welcome. Okay, so that's that's a really quick, uh, I hope I'm not running over time, um, but that's a really quick introduction into digital humanities and, uh, and Sadilar and Escalator. Um, but I was really asked and, and given the context to, to talk about this digital humanities and astronomy and um, and, and I think, yeah, I, I've been trying to think of, you know, is there an overlap? I, I already mentioned uh, Vanessa McBride's presentation. And I thought there must be an overlap, but how can I, how can I present this from a digital humanities perspective, which essentially means me moving more into your area of expertise. And, and to be honest, I, I actually don't know much about astronomy. Um, so I had to think a little bit, you know, is there an overlap? Is there really an overlap? And then I actually came up with two different things. Um, so having the focus on language, you see the, I already mentioned the background computational linguistics in South Africa. Um, and it actually reminded me of, of some work. And this is from, from years ago. And, and again, I've, I've got it on the next slide. Well, I'm really not an expert on this, uh, but alien languages. Um, so I'll briefly say something about that and then move uh, into a field that I feel slightly more comfortable with uh, identify, uh, identifying patterns in, in, in data. Okay, so I started looking at these alien languages and uh, I was actually looking for something specific. I'll, I'll mention that on the next slide, but I found some other interesting things as well. Uh, I'd like to dive into this at some point if I can find the time. Um, so there's so apparently something called astrolinguistics um, that I, I'd never heard of. I think it's pretty cool. Um, so I just grabbed a quote uh, from a book there, Astro -linguist, uh, Linguistics is the study of interstellar languages and the possibility of communication using an artificially created language that is self-contained that wouldn't include some of the aspects of, of natural languages. Okay, I think that's really cool. So you're, you're developing a particular language, you're developing this, right? This is not a natural language. You're, de you're developing a language that people can actually use and it has to have, you know, specific um, properties so I know that there are more constructed languages. Some of them are, are used also in a business context. Um, so um, manuals for the, um, the fixing of planes, for example, are written in a, in, in a constrained 
uh, language. And anyway, this was not really what I was looking for, but I still thought it was pretty cool. Um, now, what I was looking for was languages spoken by aliens. Um, and okay, I, as far as I know, we don't actually have any recordings or something of, of this. Um, but but it, it reminded me, that's why I was looking for this. And, and again, the, the disclaimers here, I'm really not an expert in this field. Um, but when I did my PhD, I did this together. I was in the same room as uh, John Elliott. And John Elliott was working on um, these alien language or extraterrestrial uh, languages. And he's continued in that field. So I know there, there are some organizations working on this. Um, and again, I, okay, I've emphasized this enough now. I'm not the expert. Um, but I remember discussions that I had with him while, while he was doing his PhD as well. Um, so you want to have a system, if you're kind of listening to space, you might be getting signals in. And the question is now, when can you actually identify whether that's a language, you know, whether aliens are want to communicate with us. So you need to be able to think about and identify, you know, what is language. Um, so we, as far, like I said, as far as I know, we don't actually have recordings of alien languages, but you want to be able to, to identify these. So what kind of properties should these signals have or what properties should language have for it to be language? And I remember that he was looking at different kind of representations. Um, so written, um, written language, uh, spoken language, uh, some sort of signs which might be different from written language. And he also looked at practical things. So we actually have you know, representations of language. So for example, you can look at Unicode and that we should be able to recognize that as language. Um, but what now if that's, for example, zipped or encoded in some way, do, do we still recognize this as language? And what is needed for that to, for us to be able to recognize that as language? Um, he also looked at approaches where we can identify, say, human languages, any human language, and languages are quite different in the world. But we also want to be able to separate that from sounds animals make or music, for example. So. You know, there's this whole idea, and that's now the, on one hand, there's this kind of space part in it, uh, aliens. Um, but on the other hand, we're really focusing on, you know, what is language? What is the, the core of what language is? And how is that different between animals and music, etc.? cetera? I, I thought it was really cool. Um, but, but anyway, let's assume that we actually have language. And um, so now I'm getting away from these, these alien languages. Um, that as far as we know, we don't have, um, but we actually do have languages here. So we can actually collect language data and then we can actually try to, to analyze that. So in language, there are some things that we can do and some things we, we can't really do, right? So if we, um, so now I'm trying to speak English, it's not my native language, but I, I hope you can understand me. But I know that there are some kind of word combinations that are not kind of valid in English, or you can come up with a situation where it's valid, but it's not normally valid. So there are kind of restrictions, there are kind of rules on how to how to use language, how to create language, how to analyze language. So what we can do, and that's what linguists have been doing and computational linguists as well, we try to model this language. Right? So we want to describe the rules that say, this is what you can do, and this is what you cannot do. Um, now, if we do that, you typically get some sort of structure on sentences, for example, or structure on words. And if we can identify these structures, um, so by modeling the languages, we can also try to use these structures to extract the information. So we can try to extract the information, for example, to find relationships between uh, entities in text. And if we have large amounts of, of data, I'm thinking, for example, of medical data, medical abstracts, where we have uh, where we know that certain diseases are mentioned or certain properties that people might have and diseases, if we can automatically extract these from these large amounts of text, we might actually find new relationships that we didn't know um, didn't know were there. Okay, um, so how does this language modeling work? And this is again, this might be very simple. You might know this already, but I don't know if you know this, yes or no. Um, so I'll, I'll just give a very brief um, uh, introduction here. So language modeling is often seen as a task called word prediction. So we simply need to guess the next word. So imagine you have a piece of a sentence saying something like, I noticed three men walking in the, 
and then you have to choose the next uh, the next word. So it could be something like a room, the walk in the room or walk in the street, um, but it won't be a word like the, right? So a sentence like I noticed three men walking in the the. Okay, that doesn't work. So we want to be able to identify the most probable, the most likely next word. And there are a lot of different ways of doing this. Um, so world knowledge, you can walk in a street or you know something like that. Um, but we can actually just start counting words. Uh, so we use something called n-grams. And if I remember correctly, that's what uh, Vanessa mentioned um, in her presentation as well. So uh, why would you want to do this? Well, you can use it for a lot of different things. Speech recognition. Um, so you analyze uh, speech sound. You want to make that into, into text. You want to be able to recognize or find the most likely next word because that will give you information on um, the, the analysis of the, the speech signal. Um, and the same, of course, then for handwriting and character recognition. Spelling correction can be done using a, a next word prediction. Machine translation uses it. But also if you use your mobile phone, if you type in a few letters, it will give you suggestion. Well, that's exactly this. Okay, so how does that then work? Um, well, a simple approach is just build a statistical model. So we want to have the probability of a word and given um, some previous words in the context, uh, in, in the sentence, in the sequence. So how do we calculate this? Well, these are just conditional probabilities. So we count how often we find the combination of these words in example data. So we need to have a large collection uh, of text. And then we simply count how often do we find these combinations of words. From that, we can calculate probabilities and we can calculate, we, we built this statistical model. We can calculate the most likely um, next word given a sequence. So that's very simple how you can do that. Um, and then, we, of course, we want to evaluate. Um, so which model is better? We can vary the, the size of the n-gram, so the size of the context. Um, and in language, at least, it, it turns out that higher order models give you better results up to a certain point because you need to have more data available to, to get the correct counts. Um, so what's typically done, you train a model using a, a training set, so a collection of text, and then you look at the performance on new data. Um, right, so that's in like a real world application. Um, and then you can use something like perplexity to calculate the most likely or the, the best fitting model, um, which is essentially a, a, a calculation of the, the probability of that test set. Yeah, so the idea here is that a lower perplexity is better because you have a better fitting model um, for this, uh, for this text, test collection that you're, you're testing your model on. Okay, and then there, there are additional techniques there. And, and again, so this is where, what I find interesting. And I really have no clue if you're using this kind of model as well, or if you're having the same problems that you, you get. So one of the problems with, with taking an approach like this is that at some point, especially when the context get large, uh, but also when you have unknown words, uh, you'll get zero probability. So you need to have sp specific techniques to do, for example, smoothing of your, uh, of your statistical, uh, your prob probability distribution. And there are a range of uh, methods that you can do, that you can use. Um, so again, I'm not sure if, how relevant these are to, to the work you're doing. Um, current approaches on, on, on work prediction are really much based on, on deep uh, neural networks. So the idea is really, you know, you train on large amounts of data in this network. Um, but then again, this uses a lot of energy. Um, so you have large companies doing this mostly, uh, Google, Microsoft, et cetera. Uh, Amazon do this mostly because they have the uh, computational power and that actually leads to pretty good results. Now, quickly going back to the South African situation, if I want to do this on the South African languages, then, okay, well, I actually need large amounts of training data, which I don't have because I have only very limited amounts of data available. Um, using large amounts of energy. Um, okay, I'm glad we're not load shedding now, but load shedding is a bit of an issue in South Africa. And because we have only limited amounts of data, we don't actually know how good these results will be. So this is like an open question in the field of digital humanities, in the field of computational linguistics. Okay, what else can we do? Um, we can, so this is uh, work that I did, for example, uh, during my PhD. 
we can also look at more structural models. So um, we have something called syntax and that describes how words can be connected to each other in a sentence. Right? So like I said, there are some words that you can kind of combine in a sentence and some words that don't. And if you kind of analyze this from a kind of theoretical linguistic um, uh, approach, you get some sort of something called higher level linguistic structures. So what you typically do first is you assign something called part of speech, which is essentially a type of word. So the is a determiner, a word like man is a noun, a walk can be a noun, or, but it's typically a verb. Um, so first you kind of assign these part of speech categories, but then you can look at you know, which kind of part of speech categories or which words can be combined um, together because they form some of the larger structure. And then you get um, 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 constructs like constitu constituency or grammatical relations between words, uh, subcategorization. So certain verbs require certain arguments, certain types of arguments. Um, I'm not going into, into that too much. Just to give you a bit of an example here, a very small one, otherwise it didn't fit on the, on the slide, but something like a flight um, has two words, of course, a, uh, which is a determiner and flight, which is a noun. So that's essentially that first level above the word, but then you can actually combine these because a flight is also more of a, 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 a concept. So a uh, and flight belong together and they build something bigger. Uh, in this case, a noun phrase, an NP. So by having these kind of context-free grammar rules on the left, you can actually analyze text such as uh, a flight or the flight, uh, and it builds these larger structures. And with these larger structures, you can find the patterns in there. You can find regularities between sentences, and that structure will also help you identify um, you know, interesting aspects in the sentence. So, so uh, entities in a in a sentence, for example. But for that, we need to have these um, these, these these grammar rules. Um, so this is a, a field, um, and I'm shifting again to, an, to another field. Um, this is what I actually used to work in for quite a long time, grammatical inference. The idea in grammatical inference is the task of we're trying to learn this grammar. So we don't actually have the grammar, that context-free grammar that I showed you in the previous slide. Imagine that we only have sequences of a particular language. And language, in this case, is not, naturally, not, not just a natural language, but it can be any, any language. So any collection of sequences. What we want to do is we want to be able to learn this grammar from the examples that we're, we're given, right? So we have example sequences from a particular language and we want to learn this grammar automatically. Now there, there are essentially two approaches to grammatical inference. The first one is for, called formal grammatical inference. And that's essentially a subfield of mathematics um, where we want to, to see, you know, what kind of, what families of languages are learnable in, in a particular setting. And families of languages, I mean formal languages. So we have, um, so th these are not necessarily natural languages because we don't know exactly where the natural languages fit in this whole organizational families of languages. Um, so finite languages, uh, for example, context-free gram uh, languages that I talked about, context-sensitive languages. These are these can be described in a in a mathematical way. So this formal grammatical inference looks at you know proving mathematically proving which families of languages are efficiently learnable. Um, and of course, you also need to think about what is efficient uh, and exactly what is learnable when you actually learn something. Uh, but another field of grammatical inference deals with empirical uh, learning. So we simply build computational systems that actually try to identify the structure from the data. And we, this is not necessarily built on kind of mathematical foundations. We don't necessarily know what kind of families of languages we're learning. We simply want to see if we get example sequences. Uh, and I, in the beginning, I worked on natural language here. So we get uh, example sentences from a particular language and we want to be able to find these kind of linguistic structures on top of the uh, the sentences so we really build a computational system where you kind of throw sentences at uh, sentences at these at this system and it will try to find these linguistic structures or hopefully linguistic structures um, and if we can do this well then we might actually kind of analyze these systems and then uh, create a mathematical proof by looking at these properties. But the nice thing about these empirical systems is that 
you know you can actually just use them um okay so like, like, like i said i worked on this um in the field of linguistics and then i realized okay if i can do it on language data i can just as well do it to other sequences so i applied it to music where we tried to find patterns typical for a composer for example uh sequences of gestures i mean people gesture move their hands around and stuff like that and we found that there is actually a relationship between patterns of gestures and how and the level of empathy that people have but of course you can also apply to language unknown languages uh techniques like these are also uh, applied to to software engineering where you want to do some sort of structured system testing where you look at messages uh, being sent uh, for example within a system or between systems uh, so this is not just on on language this is a more general approach okay so there's one more thing i'd, I'd like to uh, to show you now again shifting a little bit um so i said if we can find these patterns if we can find structure what we can also find kind of relationships uh, in text so this is some work that i did with uh, some colleagues in in the netherlands still we um, so there, there are two kinds of uh, two approaches to kind of analyzing text, and I'm now thinking, for example, of literary text. One is called um, a close reading, where you look at text in detail and you want to try and extract, you know, fine-grained analyses. And there's something called distant reading, which is a computer doing the reading of large amounts of text. So it can't do this precise reading, but it can hopefully find larger structures or larger patterns. So what we did, what we did here is we tried to find we tried to compare the two approaches. So I built a tool that can try to find a social network of characters uh, that occur in a in a in a book, whereas the uh, the other people in in this team were really the literary researchers, and they they did this fine grained uh, reading, and we wanted to see you know is there a relationship between the patterns they found and the patterns we found. So what we did is we took a book, Sadie Smith's uh, White Teeth, um, because there's some interesting kind of power relations uh, between the main character in the book. And what I did is we built um, uh, a system that identifies the names of people that's done using something called a named entity recognizer or NER. And we assumed that if people co-occur in a sentence, they have some sort of relationship with each other. Otherwise, they would not be mentioned in the same sentence so we counted how often people co-occurred in sentences and based based on these counts we created this kind of social network and then we visualized that and it was actually quite nice because this visualization could help these um close reading researchers with their with their analyses okay so what does it look like i it you get something like this okay now there's a lot of noise in this data as well there are quite a few characters in the book, uh, but not this many. So the name entity recognition doesn't work perfectly. But if we zoom in a little bit, you can already see it in the center. Um, we already see relationships here. Zoom in a little bit more. And we see that the, the main characters in the book are actually uh, identified. So Archie and Samad are the, the main characters in the book. And the, a lot of the other names are kind of related to, to them. Uh, but the main characters are, are clearly identified and also the relationship between them. So this, this actually works. It's not you know, that this gives everything, but this gives a nice overview of what's going on in the book. Um, okay, so recently I also applied this to uh, South African languages and then we, so did, there it works as well. So these are somewhat smaller books. Uh, I tried to, this on um, an Afrikaans book, uh, Chivenda and Exitsonga uh, plays. And essentially, we get the same thing. So we get the main characters out in the book. Um, and here, I so my Chivenda is really not good. Uh, but I was told that these are exactly the main characters, you know, and the relationships uh, here. So this actually kind of works as well. And the same for Xitsonga. Of course, the relationships are different. The characters are different. But this is an approach that actually works uh, in different languages. And I think that's pretty cool. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm nearing the end of the, uh, the presentation, nearing the end of the time. Um, so I hope that I, I've showed you that, you know, there are a lot of computational techniques that we're using. I, I just, I only had time to show you a few. Um, but I think if you think about the techniques you're using, 
and think about, you know, what is language, what is sentences? It doesn't have to be language, by the way, but that's really my background. Then you might see that there are actually a lot of computational techniques that might be might be quite similar. So I said the focus here was on linguistics, mostly because that's what I feel comfortable with. Uh, but digital humanities is much broader than this. I mentioned archiving, digital archiving, the music is there, uh, visual arts that I don't really know much about, but then you're say, analyzing images, which requires different techniques that might be more relevant to what you're doing. Uh, I think there are a lot of possibilities for, for collaboration. Okay, so just to conclude, um, as a, as a summary, I hope it's clear that this digital humanities kind of adds the digital to the humanities. So we really need to have these digital computational skills um, to do digital humanities, but also the humanities side, of course. Um, so we try to answer humanities questions, but we again, we use computational techniques for this. Um, at the moment in South Africa, there are a lot of humanities researchers interested in doing something like this, but they are really struggling with the computational side of things. They don't know where to start. Uh, they're really trying to find people who can help them, you know, getting started with the computational techniques or just help them with the analyses. And I want to, to emphasize, this is not humanities people trying to just use, you know, people who have computational techniques. This really, I, I really want this to be a collaboration, right? This is um, something for both uh, should come out of this kind of research. Uh, I also mentioned Sadilar and Escalator, so we tr we're really trying to bring people together. Um, I mean, I really hope that, that people like you with a more computational background um, are interested in joining as well. So please join Escalator, please take a look at the website, please join the Slack um, and collaborate. That's what really what I'm, what I'm hoping for. Okay, I'll stop here. Uh, I hope this was relevant. If you have any questions, I'd, I'd be really happy to answer them. Thanks. Hi, yes, sorry, uh, I was muted and I speaking. Yes, uh, there is a question uh, in chat box um, by Ok. Ok, it's uh, could you uh, could your social network extractor be used to find a relationship between, for example, historical events? Uh, yeah, I was just trying to find the 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 chat as well, but it was hidden in the in the Zoom interface. Um, so. Yes, it can. Uh, so it's not something that that I've done, uh, but um, a previous colleague of mine uh, did exactly this. So she was looking at. So this is not just um, main characters in a in a book. That's what what, what I've been doing here. Uh, but she was looking at it from a, a somewhat broader uh, perspective. She took um, books on history, and so this was specifically. Let me think about the. Um, the creation of unions in the Netherlands, um, so so uh, work workers unions, um, and the 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 involvement of politics, etc. So she took a lot of history books and uh, identified not just a character, so so people in the book, but also the unions. Um, and she also looked at the relationships, the kind of relationships between these. So she tried to find. So what we just did is find is there a relationship between two people but she also tried to find uh, what kind of relationship is these people working together towards a certain goal or are they kind of opposites are they kind of enemies uh, and she also tried looking at uh, a time aspect that i'm actually currently working on how do relationships change over time uh, so in a book uh, it might be that people start out being friends and then, you know, have a fight and become enemies. Uh, that's something the, the system that I, I showed you earlier cannot do. Um, but that is something that she actually tried to do as well. So she tried to find, you know, the, the, the type of relationship uh, between characters, um, etc. So this is something that can be done. Um, but, but I have to say, you know, it's not trivial. It's not that we have a system ready you shove in your text and you get this massive you know overview of everything um already this is this is really uh, ongoing work um but i know that it it is done i hope that that answers the uh the question 
Or, yeah, I yeah. think it, it would actually be nice if you now don't have the overview, kind of the, the map of, of things that uh, are related to each other. Um, I think that would be would be really nice. Um, but I think the so the idea is that you will need to get that information in some sort of way. So I'm not sure how you would how you would get that if there are books of people describing what has been done across history, or you would need to get information from websites. Or but then again, you have a computational uh, a tool, right? So that will analyze this this text. But I think that would be really nice. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Uh, uh, anyone can raise hand and uh, unmute and then ask questions. Please. Okay. In the meantime, uh, there was one comment like comment by uh, ISG. So un unfortunately, I cannot stay to them. Yes. Uh, so question. I mean, uh, comment was like. Uh, I would like to mention that computation of uh, eclipse dates has been useful in trying uh, tying down the year of historical events. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's interesting as well. Uh, I've never really thought so. I think this is really where you know the the interesting interesting uh, thing if you look at a a, a, a different research area um, comes in. I'd never actually thought about this. Um, but yeah, you can compute. I think you can compute the eclipse dates. Um, but then I think they're also related to particular geographic areas, right? So it's not um, not just the dates. Um, but that that might actually be interesting. Um, but I think the the difficulty is now not the um, yeah. Let me let me think. So what you need to know is you, if you need to know, say, the date. And the location, then, but then you would need to find the historical events that could be could have been taken place around that time. Um, I'm not sure how easy that is to find. So I'm now not even thinking about um, um, yeah. Uh, I had something in mind, and now I lost it. <laughs> um, you will need to be able to find that information in text somewhere, right? So if we're really Think about all their events, historical events. You will need to be able to find approximately when that could have happened, but also the location where that would have happened. So I think the difficulty is perhaps more you now. Where would we find these these historical events? Um, but but yeah. So I'm not a historian either. So perhaps we would need to talk to historians and information they have uh, about things that have happened. Yeah, there is an uh, there is one more question by Paul. Uh, so, me, Paul, if you want, you can unmute and ask. Uh, else, I will read it. Okay. So, uh, question is like: Do you force? Uh, do you foresee using the mention techniques for analy analyzing and understanding communication between animals? For example, whales when yeah. using recorded yeah. sound. Yeah. Um, you, I think you can. Um, again, so this is not really my area of expertise. Um, but I, I think you can do something like this. The difficulty is that uh, we can uh, record animal sounds, of course, and we can analyze them as well, but we don't know what the meaning is. So, really, creating this communication has um, has a little bit more. Um, um, yeah, aspects involved before we can do this. I know there is um, there has been work on identifying patterns in bird sounds, for example. So certain birds have particular dialects, just like just like we have, um, and a lot of birds have patterns in the bird sounds as well. So if you can identify these patterns in the bird songs, you can actually uh, kind of identify where these birds. Uh, where these birds come from. Um, so I'm not sure about whales. I know there have been recordings of whales and the, the sounds have been have been analyzed. Um, you might be able to find patterns in these um, in, in, in these sounds. Um, but I think the, the real difficulty lies if you want to communicate, 
you need to be able to understand what it what it then means. What is that wheel trying to communicate while making these sounds? Um, not too long ago, um, uh, uh, an old colleague of mine sent me a link and I, I would need to look that up, where they created an app where you could record your dog's sound uh, and that would then translate into something. I, I still don't know if that was an April Fool's um, thing or a real app where they really try to figure out what the meaning of that uh, communication is. Um, so I know that there are people working in this in this area. Um, yeah, like I said, you, I think you can analyze it and find structure in it. But the, the the real question is, you know, what does this what does this communication what does this structure mean? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, it will also be very much interesting to see whether the patterns seen in bird in one country are like uh, similar in the birds of other countries. So it's like uh, their language is different in other continents or not, or what about uh, migratory birds having mm -hmm. some common pattern? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. And, and we know there are patterns, right? So there are <laughs> there are birds who who will never sing a particular song because it doesn't fit their that kind of grammar, their their linguistic representation. Um, so in a way, birds and and probably whales as well have a certain language in their in 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 their heads, but the language um, clearly is different is, is structured differently from from natural language. But the question is, how different is that really? Um, yeah. So, uh, just one. Uh, I mean, uh, it is. It is a question about like um, uh, how computationally expensive are these techniques? Like, uh, if you try to say match the patterns in a text, uh, I mean, long text, or or maybe trying to uh, mm. uh, is, uh, analyze the patterns in a music. How, how yeah. computationally expensive are these techniques? Yeah, so that really depends on the technique. So that's a, an interesting question. Um, so at the beginning of my PhD, I actually looked into a lot of alignment techniques. So how some of the system works it work is if you have a, a particular sequence, you want to find regularities in there. So you take another sequence and you see if there are similar words in there that you can simply align. Um, so if you have something like John sees Mary and John sees the man, we can align John and sees, and we see that Mary can be replaced by the man, and we still have a valid sentence. So that technique really relies on the alignment of sequences. And in the end, I took an at a distance um, alignment technique. So that's um, essentially squared in the length of the, uh, of the sentences. Um, that's relatively relatively efficient with the current computers, uh, but I also looked at um, multiple alignment techniques that are being used, for example, in bioinformatics. Um, okay, I gave up on these because it's so extremely hard, and th they are quite a bit more computationally expensive. Um, so in in practice, I the tool that I have can easily handle several thousands of sentences within within say a few minutes, a uh, few seconds. Uh, so that is not very expensive. Uh, but if we look at the um, the word prediction models that are currently used with this deep deep learning uh, approaches, um, I don't prefer to run these on my PC here because I don't really have a, a graphical card that can 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 handle these computations um, efficiently. So that, that's a whole different order. Um, so some of the techniques are quite easy to use. So for example, the um, building of the social network, um, name entity recognition, um, that's almost like using an n-gram model. It's essentially sliding over a sequence. That's that's quite efficient. Um, and then you go over, go, go over the named entities to simply identify the relationships. It goes really quickly um, on, on books that that takes uh, a second or two three perhaps if you're if you're slow um so that's very very efficient uh, but then again if you want to do more complex things that can take uh, hours i ran um experiments with a whole uh, with a whole range of settings and uh and then it can take uh, weeks but then you're uh, talking about um say millions of of different parameters that you're you're trying to uh to optimize so it really depends.
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, when when we are using complex tech, uh, methodology, it will be like uh, needing more training to our system, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So, yeah, uh, do we have yeah? Do we have more questions for Venu? You know? Okay, not that I can see. Mm. So uh, it was really a very nice session. Uh, thanks a lot for giving this uh, insightful talk and hope to see you again in our uh, colloquium. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And please do join 